meditation for this morning is based on the gospel reading, which is today taken from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 27. And most of you probably know that we're in blue today because this is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. The word Advent means coming or appearance or arrival, originally used to refer to the appearing of a king or a god. When we speak of the season of Advent, we are both referring to our Lord's first appearance in humility as the child born of Mary of Bethlehem, and also of His coming again, His second appearance, in glory at the end of this age. So Advent theme is always about watching and waiting and being ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus. And yes, it's also kind of a countdown to Christmas. Let's be frank. When I ask the kids what the candles on the Advent wreath mean, they're most likely going to say something like, it tells us how many weeks are left until Christmas. Advent is meant to be a time to prepare, to prepare for that big day. Not in the sense so much of how many shopping days do I have to get it all in, but in the sense of getting ready for something beautiful to happen in regards to our faith. And that just as any big celebration requires some planning and preparation, when we're celebrating the fact that God's one Son became man to save the world, that takes a bit of spiritual preparation. So how is our gospel reading today geared towards our spiritual preparation for Christ? I'll always remember the professor who taught me New Testament Greek at the Concordia University I went to, Ann Arbor, Michigan. His name is Jacob Hecker. He's retired now. And once you kind of learn the fundamentals, he would then begin to call on students randomly to translate bits of the New Testament before the whole class. And now if I knew in advance that he was going to select me, say, for instance, on November 30th, then for sure I'd do the work and be ready on that day. But I might not. Be as well prepared for classes on other days, like September 20th or October 9th. But since we never knew the exact day that we'd be called on, it motivated us to be ready to go every day. So the theme for today, which is the beginning of a new church year, is really pretty much the same as the theme for last week, the last Sunday of the church year. And that's not accidental. Be ready for the Lord's return at the beginning of the day, at the beginning of the year, the end of the day, or the end of the year, and every day in between. In the last paragraph of our reading from Mark chapter 13, Jesus tells us to stay awake or keep awake three times. And there's the one little piece. He repeats it. So it must be important. And it's not literal, as if he's worried about us just kind of nodding off in the middle of the sermon. He's obviously talking about a kind of spiritual wakefulness or a, a, a spiritual alertness. The twin obstacles that we face to being alert in our hearts are drowsiness and distraction. We are easily bored. We have short attention spans. We want instant results. We have instant meals, instant communication, instant lives. We expect, therefore, instant cures to our illnesses when we get sick, instant immediate rewards for our labors and quick solutions to our problems. And when we have to wait, we get bored, impatient, and angered. And so it's kind of happened to the church in these latter days that we become easily bored with the narrative of our salvation or apathetic to our mission to baptize and to teach people complacent in our worship or sluggish in our praying. It's all just a big yawn when we become hooked on entertainment and instant gratification. The church is in danger of losing its edge. We become sleepy at the wheel. When Jesus talked about his return, both in last week's lesson and today and elsewhere, he tells us to wake up and not to be drowsy when it comes to the things of God. Today in our text, we hear Jesus tell a parable about a man who goes on a journey. He leaves his servants in charge of his property and gives them work to do while he's away. 
His last word to the servants as he closes the front door is to be ready for his return, whenever that might be. And it's not really that much unlike uh, parents today who might leave their teenagers for a time at home to look after the house while they're on a trip. For the kids, at first, it's a wonderful feeling of freedom. The whole house is yours. Uh, you can eat Hot Pockets for every meal, leave your socks lying on the floor of the kitchen. You can stay up binge watching television as late as you like and sleep on television. However, if the parents are away for a long time and the unwatered plants start to look kind of sad. No more dishes will fit in the sink and you have to run to Walmart to buy more underwear because the hand is full. The time has come to make a decision. If you take your parents seriously, you're going to want to be prepared for when they get home. After all, they could come back at any moment. It would be too late, in fact, to make beds and wash dishes and mop floors and, and do laundry as the car pulls into the driveway. And it would be even worse if you woke up in the middle of the night to find your parents standing at the end of the bed, catching you totally unprepared in the house in a mess. The point is that the children, hopefully, are not terrified that the parents will get mad at them, although there's that possibility. But you actually care about your family and about your parents, and so you want to please them because you know they love them and they provide them. Now, I suppose that if you're the type of person that wants to, uh, say, party all the time and trash the house, you kind of hope they don't come back for a really long time. But on the other hand, what if uh, you're the victim of a uh, home invasion and they've got you locked up in a closet? In that case, you probably want your folks to step up and get there as quickly as possible. And most of us are somewhere in between extremes. Sometimes we're like the partiers and we just have no thought for uh, responsibility or our duties or who we are as children of God. And we just want to enjoy ourselves and do what feels good. And we can care less about uh, God and His Word as long as the trains run on time. We give lip service to Christianity. And at other times, on the other extreme, it feels like uh, we're being beat up by the whole world. Like, Everyone's against us, and we can do nothing right. There was a news report that I saw um, a bit ago um, from New Jersey about a hiker uh, who was in the woods 45 miles northwest of New York City. And uh, this 22-year-old man was hiking in the woods last September, this September with four of his friends. And they noticed a black bear. Um, meandering in the woods not that far from them. And uh, the young man started to take pictures. It's a sad story. But he starts to take pictures with his cell phone um, and became sort of unaware of the danger he was in. And uh, unfortunately, tragically, he was uh, mauled by the bear. And it reminds me, and, you know, the pictures that you know, were put on the, on the internet. The picture. The, the story reminds me that sadly we live in a world today, I think, mean, where many times we're unaware of the serious condition of our situation. We're not always aware of how important this world is, this life is in this world in each day. We sometimes just sort of think that we're cruising along and life's just a big party. As the James Bond movie title says, that we'll just die another day. But you see, depending on how you assess your situation, the Lord's return will feel like either a threat or deliverance. Isaiah the prophet that uh, Scott read a moment ago, he prayed the first words of that line that, of the passage that was read, say, uh, where Isaiah's praying to God, essentially saying, come down here and help us. Rend the heavens, in other words, tear open the heavens and come down, God, because, uh, you know, we're in trouble here. Things were not good for Isaiah in his life. Things were not good for Israel in their lives. People were suffering, and it seemed like God was absent, not paying attention. And they begged for God to come down. And the thing is that in answer to his prayer, God did come down. He did tear open the heavens, in a way, and come down to us, but not quite in the manner that Isaiah had wanted, not in the form of armies, he came down from heaven and was conceived by the Holy Spirit of Virgin Mary. He came down much lower than Isaiah expected. God came down the first time, not as a God of power, 
not as a God of judgment, but as a God of the manger and the cross to serve. Serve in him. And to die for our sins. He came to be with us, to be one of us, to join our humanity as the God who breathes and bleeds and sweats and dies. He came down to us as the child of Bethlehem, the son of Mary, the carpenter of Nazareth, the preacher of Galilee, the beggar king and the bar of donkey, the crucified son of God. So this Advent and always, be watchful, be aware, be alert. Keep your eyes and your ears locked on Jesus Christ, not on the noise of the world. Confess your sins, hear his forgiveness, and expect always Jesus to save you, to forgive you, and to raise you from the dead. It will be worth the wait. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in truth.